So, when you think of the most influential books in history, what, what comes to mind? Now, the Bible, certainly, that's one of the, one of the most influential. Um, today we have what we call bestsellers, uh, which works in, in our uh, modern books, but there a lot of times before there was, a lot of the books that were influential are part of public domain, uh, or before they had copyright laws and things like that. But the Bible always ranks up there uh, really, really high. Um, it might be also be the book that has been the most printed and least read book in history um, as well. But likewise, you have good books like the, the Quran, um, uh, just because the scale of, of the number of people in China, you know, one of the probably the most read books in the world is the, is the quotations of Chairman Mao, uh, the little red book that, that he had. So there's, there's lots of words that are out there. And if you look beyond English, probably the, probably the most, the, the most uh, uh, printed book in the world was a Chinese dictionary that they use in school, uh, simply because of the masses of, of people. But if we're looking at English, uh, English language, um, especially novels, it's hard to, hard to beat Harry Potter, at least in modern times, for someone who, the amount of, of books that have been written or that things that are in print. If you go back a generation, J.R. Tolkien. Um, you go further back, maybe Dickens. Uh, if you go beyond English, um, books like Don Quixote or Little Prince had huge, uh, huge impact on people. But for uh, those who are baby boomers and their legacy, you need to also factor in the books of Dr. Seuss, all right? Over 50 years, Dr. Seuss uh, wrote books, 44 books, over 200 million of them in print. That makes a difference uh, in, uh, in, in the lives of people. And I, I, I love reading Dr. Seuss. It's one of the best things about becoming a grandparent. I get to read him again, uh, and repeatedly. Um, and in many ways, I found these, these stories of Dr. Seuss function similar to the way that Jesus would use parables because they're short little stories that sort of sneak up on you. You think you're reading it simply to be entertained, and all of a sudden there's a little twist that makes you think about life in a different way. Now, Dr. Seuss was not particularly religious, but it never stopped God from using people, right? Um, still does today. But today we're going to take a look at one of, one of his books. Uh, it's called uh, Green Eggs and Ham, right? Uh, written about 60, 60 years ago, it was first written, and it was written on a bet, all right? Um, a few years earlier, about I think 1957, uh, Seuss had written a book called The Cat in the Hat. Um, and it, there wasn't a really big vocabulary on it. I think there were only 225 words in the whole book. And I used them more than once, but 225 different words. And so uh, uh, Dr. Seuss's editor wondered, I wonder how many words you could get down to and still be able to tell a story. So we bet Dr. Seuss he could not write a book with 50 words or less, all right? Uh, and so Dr. Seuss wrote Green Eggs and Ham. Now there's uh, 750 words, so those 50 words get used a number of different, those number of different times. So who's familiar with the storyline of Green Eggs and Ham? At least half of you. All right. So um, it's just for those who aren't or maybe you haven't read it for a while, just a quick little uh, update. It's told by this unnamed narrator who is being invited by someone called Sam to try eating something called green eggs and ham. Um, and so the story just unfolds between this narrator who's being asked to try something and Sam who's trying to convince him to, to try it. So the basic premise is, Sam says, do you like green eggs and ham? Uh, the narrator says, I do not like them. Sam, I am. I do not like green eggs and ham. Uh, Sam continues, would you like them here or would you like them there? And he replies, I would not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them. Sam, I am. Now, some people at this point would say, okay, and walk away. But we make a very short story. Um, not Sam I am. Sam I am knows that these green eggs and ham are delicious. If he would just try them, he would discover for himself that this is a wonderful thing. So Sam tries a, a different tack. 
Maybe it's all in presentation. Would you like them in a house? Would you like them with a mouse? I do not like them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. And so the story goes, right? Sam continues to invite those invitations, continue to be refused. Finally, at the, the very end, he's getting uh, upset. He says, I would not, could not on a boat. I will not, will not with a goat. I will not eat them in the rain. I will not eat them on a train, not in the dark, not in a tree, not in a car. Let me be. I do not like them in a box. I do not like them with a fox. I do not eat them in a house. I will not eat them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. But finally persistence of Sam I am wears him down, all right? And he says, this, Sam, if you will let me be, I will try them and you will see. So he tries them and say, I like green eggs and ham. I do. I like them, Sam I am. I would eat them in a boat. I would eat them with a goat. I would eat them in the rain, in the dark, and on a train, and in a car, and in a tree. They're so good, so good, you see. So I will eat them in a box. I will eat them with a fox. I will eat them in a house. I will eat them with a mouse. I will eat them here and there. Say, I will eat them anywhere. I do so like green eggs and ham. Thank you, thank you, Sam I am. So there's a story. Uh, Sam I am becomes, uh, for me, this model of persistence and great creativity. He's not easily discouraged. He realizes change doesn't happen overnight. In many ways, I, I think of him as the ultimate evangelist, taking seriously this call to share something good uh, that will enhance the life of others. Reminds me of a, a parable that Jesus once told from the Gospel of Luke. The parable goes like this. In a certain uh, city, there was a judge who neither feared God or had respect for people. And in that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while, he refused. But later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God, no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so she may not wear me out by continually coming. The Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So, what's the point here? Uh, go out and be annoying? <laughs> no. Uh, if you bug God long enough, he'll give you what you want? No, that's not the point. Uh, so the point is, God's not like this unjust judge. Uh, and we can find inspiration in this widow about not giving up, even when it seems impossible. We look at our world, uh, um, and we, we know that things are not the way that they're supposed to be. Evil seems to be way too prevalent entrenched with those who have power and wealth. And uh, they seem to be stacking the deck in their favor against any sense of, of justice. And this isn't, this isn't anything new. Um, uh, it was going on uh, back at the time of Jesus and long before then. So we keep on keeping on in the face of resistance. We know that there's always going to be um, uh, the, the presence of evil in our world, and we need to keep working against that. Uh, persistence becomes important. Dr. Seuss submitted his first book 27 times before someone agreed to publish it, thought it was worth something to put into print. He didn't give up. There's often resistance to things that are a little bit different or new in some ways. Uh, many of the strides that we made towards our, the civil, deliber civil liberties that we take for granted now were met first with resistance. A couple years ago, um, uh, Chelsea Clinton uh, wrote a book. The book was called She Persisted, all right? Stories of women who would not give up in an effort to make the world more just. And so she tells the story of people like Harriet Tubman, Helen Keller, Ruby Bridges, Sally Ride, and, and nine others. 
um, who by their persistence helped bring about a change to make a world more just, a world more equitable, uh, more compassionate. And all of them faced resistance. People who didn't believe that a, a woman or a, or a person of color or someone of a different faith or someone of a different sexual orientation or whatever, whatever it is that made them different was somehow equal to them, yet they persisted. Many of them were pioneers in their fields that changed their, um, people's attitudes by their example. <coughs> Any of us who are parents know the frustration of Sam I am, trying to introduce new foods. Uh, and and you, you, put, you, 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 you cook supper and you put it out on a plate um, and you meet with, with the pronouncement is says, I don't like that. It says, you haven't tried it yet. I don't like that. Uh, whatever it is, they haven't even, even tasted it yet. They already know that they're not going to like it. Anyone ever had that experience? Of doing it? Okay, yeah. So it's hard to convince someone of something's goodness if they won't even try it, right? That's true for food. It's also true for lots of other things in life. It's true, I think, for faith as well. Some people have belief systems that are in place that are based on faulty assumptions. Um, whatever it was, they, they have this worldview that they got from someplace. Uh, when I was growing up, I had pretty set ideas about what I thought for sure was true and what was not true in regards to, to race or gender or sexual orientation because of the world that I had grown up in. It was only through experience with personal relationships with people of other races, other genders, other sexual orientation that my ideas began to change. When I could see for myself, God was doing a, do, a new thing. God was, God was at work in these people. And, and people that I had thought, I had somehow written off before then that they were not, uh, uh, not a, a means in which God could be at work. We heard earlier in our reading, uh, Marv read this letter, part of this letter to the Corinthians, uh, where, where Paul reminds us that God is always doing something new. God is making of us a new creation. And it's based on love. He says it's this love of God that urges us on uh, to recognize that God is at work doing new things. And we have incredible news to share. Something even better than green eggs and ham, right? The, uh, the love of God that will never let us go. This power of love that can transform lives. A light that beats back the darkness. A hope that overcomes fear. A life that triumphs over death. This is the love of God. Um, last week, when we were looking at his letter to the Romans, uh, we, we had that wonderful promise that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. God will not let us go. And so, like Sam, I am, I encourage us uh, to invite others to experience this reality we know of grace, of God's incredible love for us, and, and to do that creatively and persistently. We don't try to force or command or legislate, uh, legislate behavior. We, uh, and we don't want to let judgmental, hypocritical uh, people who maybe call themselves Christians grab the headlines or define for us what it means to follow Jesus. I mean, Jesus is the one who defines what Christianity is about, and so we, we pattern our lives as much as we can on Jesus. Let our love, our compassion, invite people to experience uh, a love that will not let them go. Uh, we, we invite people to what we know is true, that God is love, and love will not let go. We invite our, our band to come up. There's a, there's a song. Um, uh, you heard it as you were coming in. The song it says, You Never Let Go talking about um, this, this love of God um, that uh, uses part of the text from the 23rd Psalm of walking through the shadow of, uh, of, uh, of death, knowing that even there in the midst of the most difficult times, um, God is, is with us. Uh, and to claim this promise um, that he never let go.